seven o'clock and I will call the meeting to order. Good evening, everybody. I hope that you're all doing well. Good evening. Thank you for making the time to be here tonight. All right, I'm gonna pull up my agenda. All right, is there any public to be heard? Erica, you might be the one who knows that. Um, Brian, I did not hear anything from Nicole about that. I don't have anything okay. in the shared okay. notes. Uh, Karen Phillips is here. Um, I don't see any public. I don't have notes of any public who specifically signed up. So I will assume there is no public to be heard. And with that, we will move on to the approving the minutes from the September 10th board meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Motion to approve. Great. And a second? Second. Deanna seconds. Thank you. Are there any modifications or clarifications required on the board meetings, uh, board minutes? Take that as a no. So all in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, Karen, who's taking notes? Me. Okay. <laughs> raise your hand for Karen. She's our, <laughs> our note taker. If I can't see everybody, you, you can see everybody, right, Brian? Yeah, so I have Deanna Graham, Madeline, Ann, Karen Phillips, myself with our hands raised. Caitlin is either going to, oh no, she's raising her hand. Okay. Caitlin is making the bold move of voting for approving the minutes as well. So that motion passes. Okay, which brings us to the borrower rehabilitation loan modification request. Kathy, are you going to walk us through that? I am. All right, the floor is yours. All right, so this is a household that received a rehab um, loan and it was a uh, repayment one because of the income that they had at the time when they um, applied. And they were making payments and everything was going along fine until COVID hit and the husband lost his job. And they contacted us right away. We've been um, working with them um, around this. Uh, we deferred for a short period of time, which staff has the ability to do. Um, but now um, things have not gotten um, any better. And so they are um, requesting assistance and staff's recommendation is to move this to a, a fully deferred loan, a permanently deferred loan um, with the principal set where it currently is now. Um, and then repayment would come to us at refinance, um, sale, or transfer of the home. Um, they have met with the housing counselor as is, is required, um, and it is showing that they have a, a monthly deficit. They have a couple of kiddos in, in college, um, in addition to trying to, to make it through this. So it just seemed like it is postponing the inevitable if we went um, to a, like a, a year's worth of deferred um, payments to see how things um, expanded um, as opposed to just going ahead and doing a permanently deferred loan. So that is, um, that's staff's recommendation. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions for Kathy? I have one question. Uh, so based on their AMI, it was not a permanently deferred, but now Perfect. they've dropped down. Mm -hmm. It is and it's what was it sixty eight thousand? Is that right? Eighteen. Oh, eight, eighteen. Okay, I looked at the wrong number. Um, so I'm only curious in regards to process. Uh, God willing, things will get better, and uh, everybody will be back at full employment. Or yeah, let's just say everybody. Uh, <laughs> is there a time when? the city would review that and say, you know, th this really should move back to a repayment status. Um, no, if, 
sorry <laughs> to interrupt if no. we're if we're going to the permanently deferred then we would just leave it at that okay. um, at that time and not switch things back and forth they can always make payments if they want to if things do get better and they want it you know not hanging over their heads or want to be able to sell free and clear they can go ahead and make payments and we'll take those and um okay. keep track of it but um we once we defer it we just leave it that way and not go back and forth okay we try not to do this as as many as few times as possible <laughs> for, right for client right <clears throat> and my sense is even when things do return to more stability and employment people are going to be catching up for a long time yeah it's not like that's, all that's so. what we are thinking that it's going to be very difficult to recapture their financial position where they were so yeah some might but you know a lot of them are going to struggle for quite a while okay is there a motion to approve uh, let's see are we approving your recommendation or are we moving to so let's say to approve staff's recommendation to move this loan to permanently deferred motion to approve staff's recommendation to move the loan to permanently deferred Thank you. Second. Second that. Thick. Anne. Okay. Caitlin, you're you're like super fast with that hand, uh, but then at the same time I got the voice, so my brain can't parse the two. Uh, so <laughs> seconded by Anne. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand so it is visible, uh, and that is. Anne, Karen Phillips, Madeline, Caitlin, Graham, and Diana, and myself. So all in favor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm glad that we can bring at least some relief to uh, their difficult situation. That really is hard. Um, Karen, the the uh, next section on the allocation, and I know that we were going to talk about the board had requested some equity language, and that was going to be in there. Do you want to wait for Eliberto, and we can move yes, forward sir. with? Yeah, because he, yes. <laughs> so I, maybe we can, if you want to, um, because and he is the probably the point person for home study, so maybe we can, Brian, we can jump down to the site visit updates. So sure. Matt will be here tonight and uh, Graham and talk about Lama Meals on Wheels and Boulder Shelter. And then okay. we we'll back up to the other one El Ellie Berger gets here. That sounds great. So why don't we go to <laughs> agenda leave. item seven, site visit update. Kathy? I'm just leaving. I'm, I'm just going to leave. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. Have a great evening. Bye. We will move to agenda item seven, site visit updates, starting with Longmont Meals on Wheels and board member Woodley. Looks like that's you. All right. I uh, do, 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 do. don't have my notes, but I'm gonna go from memory. Um, Alberto and I met with the, the people from Meals on Wheels and we were privy to meet the uh, the first shift i'm going to say um just before they go into the change that was quite impressive we did a full tour of the facility to include the kitchen to include how they actually package the meals prepare the meals and um if i recall correctly some people some of those volunteers have been there in excess of 10 years. And uh, they're very, very dedicated, very committed. Um, in I was very impressed with uh, the management. Uh, it's, uh, the facility is, is very, very, very nice. And um, as far as uh, the details of it, I'll have to find that, bit, but I did have uh, the number of meals that they do per day, the deliveries they do, uh, essentially, and uh, actually, I didn't see my name on here until tonight. <laughs> so uh, I will um, 
like to get do a reprieve for our, our next meeting, and I'll have those stats for you. Okay. But uh, I took very, I did take very meticulous notes, but uh, that was months ago. I have no idea where that folder is. <laughs> I, I think now, we all I, I will. feel that way when it's our turn. Um, yeah, but I'd like to, I would like to share that with you because I did take uh, notes. I was impressed, and I think it's information that you should have and you should know in case you don't. Okay. So if, if okay, if it's okay, I'd like to give you more um, on the agenda for our next meeting. Okay. Madeline, I... did you try any of the food? No, I did not. It looked scrumptious, but uh, <laughs> I am, uh, I I'm not the easiest person to try and serve food. <laughs> But it was, it looked very scrumptious. It looked very healthy. And I just loved the enthusiasm that they worked with and how they got along. And, you know, it, it was more of a family environment and you could feel it. And so, yeah, but I, I will give you more details uh, based on the notes I took because I really wanted to share it. <laughs> but I, I will do that next meeting if that's okay. That's great, Madeline. And just one question, if mm -hmm. you do remember, if you don't, that's fine. Did they speak at all about how the pandemic has shifted their business? Are they getting an increase in requests or do you recall? Actually, I, no, our visit was before the pandemic. Yeah, okay. it was before, yeah, it was before that. We actually went to the to their office, to the facility, and actually we were face-to-face, -face, no mask, <laughs> the wow. pandemic, I think, was uh, it was months away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but, Thank uh, you. Appreciate yeah. it. You know what? Uh, between now and our next meeting, that is something I'll find out and include in, in uh, what I give you next uh, meeting. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious, just in terms of our food uh, supply. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the needs, and there's been various kind of different impacts across the food supply chain and. Um, be interested to hear how they're faring and and uh, how they've been impacted. Absolutely, I will do. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll just do a follow up call uh, to them uh, somewhere between now and uh, our next uh, visit. Thank you, Matt. Our next uh, meeting. I'm sorry. Great. Thank you, Karen. Uh huh. So, um, so Brian, yeah. The Meals on Wheels did really step up their efforts during, um, you know, during COVID. Certainly, that the first few months when we were shut down and, and stay at home. So, so Meals on Wheels is they are not yet serving their congregate meals at the okay. center, so that still remains closed. But they did really ramp up their efforts in their home delivered meals and. Um, I know they signed up many new members. They really helped out with, um, you know, in the living facilities. So they, they really did step up and increase their, um, you know, their delivery and their clients during, during the shutdown for sure. That's great. Um, and, you know, I think some of these organizations that were already well set up for distribution door to door and had facilities for preparation um, we're in a, excuse my, my assistant here, um, we're in a pretty good position to uh, be able to add that extra help if they were getting the support they needed in order to do it. And I also am thinking about COVID, uh, people who are quarantining. I know there's an effort now to try to help people who are quarantining, deliver them food and meals so that they don't need to leave the house and encourage that. So. Um, wonderful. Okay, uh, Graham, you visited the Boulder Shelter. Do you need a few minutes to get your notes? No, I've, I've done that already and realized that um, I need to work on my handwriting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just put it up to the camera, we'll help you decipher. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> um, so I we did a Zoom call, Eliberto and I, with Greg over there, the, the boss man at the shelter, because it was two or three weeks right after the, the pandemic. It was it was directly after it settled in. And they were kind enough to still sort of carve out some time in their schedule to talk to us. And uh, we kept it pretty brief, though. Um, 
you know, they were very honest about the fact that they couldn't really meet Boulder County Public Health distancing requirements and they they weren't pretending to, you know, and so he was just frank about that. It, it may be different now, it's, it was months ago, but um, he's like, they're, we're trying, we're doing what we can, but there's only so much. Um, at the time they were providing hotel vouchers for um, the elderly or the more at risk population and setting them up in hotel rooms for two weeks so they could be uh, quarantined. They, at the time they were, concerned about how how far they'd be able to take that and then we're looking into gathering resources so I, I don't know how that panned out if they're still able to do that but I know that was something they were really focused on at the time was to identify the the more uh, susceptible um, populations and get them in better situations than the shelter um, general stats is is they said they see about 1200 different people per year a lot of repeats um, and then folks that maybe they struggle to document really well. Um, 10 to 20 percent of those are they would consider Longmont, um, Longmont folks. Um, so it's a couple hundred a year different people considered to be Longmont residents that they serve it sounded like. What was the percentage Graham? I'm sorry I didn't hear. 10 to, 10 to 20 percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, According to these notes, anyway. <laughs> um, and they said that there's a staff working coordinated entry in Longmont five days a week um, that is helping that. Um, we asked how you know, Longmont could help and what their biggest obstacles were. And he said something interesting to me, and, and that was that shelters really aren't a great solution. Um, for the problem and he said that what we need are housing ass assets and we need to, to work more at assisting people and transitioning well and that that really should be the focus and what this board and Longmont can do to help is is help encourage and develop and promote spaces to transition the people in shelters out of the shelters into more stable housing and they saw in last year, 119 confirmed transition um, folks into stable housing. Um, as far as um, diversity, they're doing LGBTQ plus training with their staff. Um, they're doing resident surveys, which are anonymous. Um, they have a board member who uh, was a shelter participant at one point, um, and they they host informal focus groups um, so they can understand better about how their services are affecting their target population. Um, and they're working closely with Hope and Homeless Solutions for Boulder County and um, focused outreach. Um, I think those were the biggest things. Yeah, any questions about that? Thank you. Yeah, any questions for Graham? I, as usual, do have a question, um, which is, it seems to me there was a time, and, and Karen, I think this will probably be one that uh, you might have to weigh in on as, as well. But I remember not, you know, a couple years ago, there was a lot of discussion about competition between the homeless services. Uh, there seemed to be not a lot of cooperation and collaboration between like the shelter and say Bridge House or which is distinctly bolder, but the idea that it seemed like there wasn't a lot of coordination and, and a sense of people were fighting for each other for resources. Um, so it's interesting, Graham, you mentioned transition, which is specifically Bridge House, and that is a Boulder program. But do they, Bridge House does, that's their thing, right? Is taking people off the street and preparing them for productive housing and jobs and training. Um, do you know, did he mention whether they work together or not? And Karen, part of this will go to the coordinated entry, whether that maybe has repaired some of that. I don't have any uh, recollection of Bridge House coming up. So okay. I'll defer to Karen on that. Okay. 
So yes, I can I can take that. So when we, um, I think certainly the homeless solutions for Boulder County was an outgrowth of um, some work and um, efforts to to really have the homeless services providers uh, be more coordinated to really work on uh, you know a common. Um, a common goal, common purpose, a common screening process, um, and then really determine what are the services that we should put in place that really moves folks faster into housing and exiting out of homelessness mm -hmm. rather than continuing to provide support and services that keep people living on the street and not moving people um, into homelessness. So. So, um, so that certainly brought all the providers together. Um, and and um, for the first two years of Homeless Solutions for Boulder County, Bridge House was the navigation services provider for the um, for City of Boulder and Hope, and then Hope and Our Center, and then Hope. Well, they were the navigation providers for Longmont, and then the Boulder Shelter was the um, was provided the housing focus shelter. So where the folks who are experiencing homelessness and were more vulnerable than they were, I mean, there's a whole screening criteria, but they were folks that were referred to house, uh, housing focus shelter at the Boulder shelter. So okay. that's pretty much how the home, how HSBC operated in, um, in the first couple of years. We, Rebid the services, as you might recall, in 2019 for 20. And Bridge House no longer put their hat in the ring for navigation services. They operate what they call a ready to work program. And so, um, you know, where folks live in, in the um, live in the building, they get job training, you know, they work either in the lawn care and maintenance services or the food preparation. Mm -hmm. So they basically they got out of the navigation services and Boulder Shelter now provides the navigation services for um, the city of Boulder as well as the housing focused shelter for, um, for sorry. Whenever the phone rings my dog thinks it's for him. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, so anyhow, so, um, so yes, the, the working relationship was, you know, was, was better. Um, and like I said, and now Bridge House is basically saying, you know, we're, we're really working for folks who um, were providing housing and we are helping them with um, job readiness. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. I'm glad to hear it's a little more, I guess the, the structure helps understand how people fit in and, and share resources. I mean, Karen worked very hard on this. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's not without its challenges because, um, you know, there are a lot of one-off situations or there are, there are folks that we are seeing that, that don't really fit into um, the, you know, the homeless solutions system or they're really, are they're not interested or, for whatever reason, they're just, they're still homeless in our communities and not engaging in services through Homeless Solutions for Boulder County. So yeah. those are the challenges that we continue to deal with. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, board member Yarbrough is not here. Um, so we will have to defer the Blue Sky Bridge discussion to our next board meeting. And so in Alberto, I, I got, I just checked and it looked like um, he was even running a little bit later. So, um, so I think what I will do, um, Brian, if that's okay, you all had the, received the, if we can move to, I have too many jobs tonight. <laughs> so, um, move to item number six and the home steady presentation. This presentation was in your packet. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I won't go over um, all the specific details, but 
I, I guess we wanted to give you a, um, a, at least a high level update of, of what's happening with Homesteady. We have, uh, you know, we have certainly um, at the end, there's Eliberto. So at the end of this year, will have been, you know, two full years of um, operation of the home study program. And, um, and so, so I think one of the things that we wanted to do was to, to, to check in and, and, you know, at, at this point in time, I think, you know, unless we get different input from the advisory board, that we plan to still consider um, it's $200,000 that we set aside as part of our um, money that we have for human service agency funding um, to continue to invest in homeless uh, prevention services. So, so anyhow, but um, so if you just kind of look in your, in your packet, again, we, we launched the, uh, the home study program in April of 2018. And, and this was as, as a result of what we saw in the, the previous human services needs assessment that we accomplished, which um, which had a, a pretty significant amount of, of community members or households in Longmont that were um, that were a, a an unexpected is expense or you know if there was a like a medical situation or maybe a temporary loss of job or, or whatever that that um, there were there were I, I think it was you know over 30%, between 30 and 35% of households that indicated that, you know, um, their housing was at risk should some unexpected ex expense, um, should they incur some unexpected expense. So, um, so our, our certainly we, our interest was keeping people housed and preventing people from becoming homeless uh, rather than the more expensive services once folks did lose their housing. So. So um, on slides four and five of the PowerPoint that we sent out is, um, is, is a summary of the data for 2019, as well as um, through the end of July in 2020. The, um, the amount, because that $20,000 pays for a, a case manager. Um, you know, our center is the contractor. It, play, it pays for one uh, case manager or staff member at the R center. And um, and then there's usually around um, 120,000, maybe a little bit more, that's available for direct assistance. And and just a reminder that it is that households can receive direct payments at a three up to three thousand dollars. Again, so the intent is to help help in whatever way would be if, if they're flexible dollars. So if it's an unpaid medical bill, that um, that those dollars could go to help pay off. Um, just so that we could keep people on track with paying their, um, you know, their housing costs. So, so it's up to three thousand um, dollars per household. So that's roughly forty households that can be served. Um, that they can serve maybe a few more, depending on if the household doesn't need as much of that three thousand dollars to get back on their feet. COVID pretty much has blown a lot of that out of the water. Um, but, but we'll, you know, we'll we'll get to that. But so you can see in terms of 2019 that we served uh, 47 households, and there again is some additional, um, you know, data that most most were able to, you know, to stay in their in their homes. Um, three of the 47 lost their their housing. Some moved out of the area, but 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 um, you know, generally speaking, the folks were able to remain. Uh, stably housed with the assistance they were receiving from Homesteady. Thus far in 2020, we the R Center has served 17 households, and um, thus far the folks that had exited the program, uh, none had lost their housing. Um, some had moved out of the area, and those those kinds of, of things. And then again, certainly there has been a lot of rental assistance that has come the R Center's way to help Longmont households who have been impacted by COVID. So, um, so anyhow, and what, um, and one of the questions that, uh, you know, we talked about is, um, so what, in Eliberto, are you on? Hello? I can take over if you're okay with that. I had a question. So, yeah. 
so what was the differentiation between the households um, that were getting yeah. assistance? So you, you gave me the answer, but I don't remember it. <laughs> well, I, I, I can address that. I can. So Karen had a really, Karen had a really good question. And it's a really good point. Uh, as you know, as we've gone into COVID, there's been a lot of resources, both federal, state, and local, thrown into housing as stability, housing assistance. And so we were wondering um, what differentiates uh, a, a household that is receiving those type of funds from um, a home study household. And what we learned was from the Arts Center was when, they, when COVID first hit, um, basically there was no differentiation. But as they, as they kept going and people were not getting jobs or being able to go back to jobs because their industry was still shut down, they realized that home study really worked better for folks that actually had a job and had some sort of uh, 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 medical bill. Typically it is medical bills, sometimes a situation where um, they had extra expenses that month uh, to, in order to cover their rent. And so they kind of started screening for that. So now, um, you need to have a job in order to get home steady. Uh, if you don't have a job, then there is a plethora of other resources that can, can support you um, to stay housed. So that, that's a differentiation that, that happened very quickly uh, as they learned once COVID started. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. And I, I just wanna throw this out there real quick. Um, and food distribution for food access, we've seen you know, all kinds of unexpected things. One of them was we expected a lot more engagement with uh, COVID happening. And for our program, we didn't see as much of an increase as we expected because we're not terribly anonymous. And what we found was that a lot of the new uh, pe people who were signing up that hadn't received benefits before were really migrating towards those sources where you could just pull up and put a box in the car and no questions asked or you know something that was pretty anonymous and uh, so it's interesting this finding that you have and um, you know maybe that's one of the benefits if there are any of this situation is that we get to learn a little bit more about our client base. Uh, Karen, you're on mute. Karen's on mute. There you I'm go. not anymore. So do you <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, so anyhow, do you, Eliberto, is there anything else that you want to add? Um, and then I think the other thing is just based on what you're what you're hearing, what you're seeing in terms of the statistics, how we're using these dollars. Uh, is there any uh, concern about continuing to move forward with this investment in homeless prevention services as as we have outlined in Homestead. Any stay the course, make a change, whack it, you know, any thoughts? So I'd like to, to draw the attention. Of, oh, go ahead, sorry. I think you have the floor, Alberto. Um, I one of the things that we've been really working, and I've been working very diligently with the R Center because this is um, important to Karen and I. I think to the board is how do we with all and not just home study, but any program that we do, we want to ensure that we are trying to do as much of a robust evaluation process as possible. So yes, we can get you the the quantitative numbers of how many we serve. How many are still still housed? How many lost housing? That we keep and we, we know, but we we we've been working um, to ensure that we do more of a qualitative type of um, evaluation as well. So at toward the end of your of your uh, slideshow or the slides that were in the packet uh, is a, is the results of some of some evaluative uh, surveys that we started doing with uh, clients in 2020 primarily. It took us a while to get this off the ground, um, but it's showing some good results. And I really wanted to talk about, um, and let me see if I can share, can I share my video, Erica, uh, my screen? I, I, I think it's co-host you have. You I think you should have co-host rights, Alberto. You should be able to share. Okay, I wanted to share, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I know we got a lot of stuff on the agenda, um, but I wanted to talk about, um, 
gone through most of the agenda. <laughs> okay. And item. Uh, so I, I, we've we've gone. Good. FYI. Okay. Good. Sorry. Uh, football practice went a little late. Um, so um, so Rita, I want to talk about a question for you. I think this is why it's important that home study the what we have on home study. So we have thirteen answers. And you can see how it's divided. And then I asked, I actually added on there the, the actual breakdown of question four. And so then you write, the question is, how confident do you feel you're going to remain in your housing for the foreseeable future? Um, and so when you look at the breakdown, you know, five are very, uh, um, there's five that are very, they're very confident they can do it. But look at the, that, at the number three, which is, um, you know, one, two, between one and three, how confident they are. And you see that there's still people that are feeling a little um, not confident that they can remain in their housing. Um, so I, I really wanted to just share that because I think it's still a challenge. And I think this is why homesteady is important. Uh, whether we, how we deliver it, we could always change it. But I just felt that you know that that showed that people are still um, concerned about keeping their housing, um, and it, and housing is a huge issue. And Home City has done really good work, but it's still, it, it's just, a, it's just a, an issue that folks in Longmont are facing um, and will be facing for some time until we can work on our for, uh, more affordable housing. So that was my only ex other piece from this, uh, from this presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Any questions for Alberto? Council Member Christensen? Um, I don't know if this is a question so much as a comment. Um, I think you can see from the results that single parents are far and away the most vulnerable uh, in this situation. Um, there wasn't any kind of breakdown of ages, but single parents are in the utterly impossible situation of now having to be home to help their children who are home, but having to also somehow have a job to pay to feed the kids and have a house room over their head. And it's just, it's very difficult. I remember when we had the RISE program, uh, that was also the most helpful to single parents who stayed with it longer because they were highly motivated because <laughs> they have such a hor horribly difficult time. Um, I'm just wondering whether we have any specific program that is geared toward helping single parents in this city at all? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of, of our programs don't necessarily focus on single parents, but, um, but I, would, I would agree with your statement that that, that may be a major um, population that is served by a lot of our, our programs, even if that is not the particular target population. Um, now, there are programs that we don't fund that I think are still around that uh, focus primarily on, on um, single parents. Like, I think the Pearl Group is still around um, that was originally at a life bridge and they became their own nonprofit. And they, they've they always been focused on single mothers. Um, so, that, that program, I think, is still around. Um, but other than that, I don't think of any, I don't think any program that specifically focuses on single mothers outside of the mother house, but that is a very specific program around homelessness, um, not necessarily self-sufficiency. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a really good point because uh, with COVID and children having to be home disproportionately that burden falls on the mother. And I know that there's discussion about how far will this set back women professionally uh, just because of the impact of not being able to engage professionally as they normally would. Uh, so I wonder if, you know, just kind of keeping it in the back of our minds in terms of how it fits into the needs assessment this specific contemporaneous issue and, and whether we want to think about that. Uh, I don't know if the women's work does that. 
I mean, they help with some things. I don't know if it's right. They're more of a direct financial assistance. They don't provide yeah. the wraparound case management type of, or you know, or professional yeah. development type of job training. Um, there are agencies that do that, but again, they're not necessarily focused on single on single parents. They but single parents probably make up a lot of their population. And yeah. there's the county program, family self self sufficiency. Exactly. So there are. And that may be a, a a demographic when we think about outreach as a general idea, contacting people to make them aware that there are services available. I, you know, I think often the ones who, the people who are going to apply the least are the ones who haven't done it in the past, and they're going to have no idea really what's out there. Um, so, you know, that may be something that, something worth consideration. I don't know what role we play in that, but um, I think it is worth thinking about because a lot of people are going to need help. A lot of people are going to be behind. Um, Alberto, so first of all, uh, are there any other, Karen Phillips, did you have a question? No. Okay, you're just adjusting your computer. No. Anybody else have a question or comment for Alberto? Diana? I guess, I don't know if you touched on this, but it looked like for the data through 2020 that if you did for basically half the year that people are accessing the program less in 2020, do you think that's just because maybe during the first part of the shutdown, things were sort of on hold. And, and since July, do you have any feedback on, um, because we're in October now, on how the program is being accessed and whether we've seen a huge jump in it? I guess I'm just wondering if this is one of the areas that might be especially hard hit because of COVID. I mean, I feel like everything's gonna need more money, but if we're really serving through this program, single parents and they're being hardest hit by COVID, then should we talk about whether the same funding is appropriate, changing the funding? I, I don't know. Like, I don't want to open a can of worms, but if this is a really hard hit segment of the population, then maybe we should talk about whether they're going to need more resources through this program. So, um, yes, 17 is low, but those, those are um, 17 who completed the program. So there's still people in there that are still going through it. Um, we always, and then we always tend to get a surge toward the end of the year. And, and part of it, and this is an assumption, but I think it's true. Part of it is usually in the beginning of the year, you get um, income tax dollars that help carry folks. And then toward the end of the year, folks are, are struggling. Um, so we, we all, we've not, not in the, since 2018, we've never had less than 40 clients. So I'm not too worried about it. And I, I also wonder if the enhanced unemployment benefits help some people in those early months. That, that is very, that's very possible. But yeah, we've always hit the numbers. So I've never, I've never, I mean, and, and, and now even more, the challenge might be finding people with jobs that fit this, you know, so we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll close a close eye on it. I, I, I talk to them on a monthly basis and sometimes more. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll keep time and, and report back to the board. Thank you. I have one technical question. What is non-compliance where we have exited due to non-compliance? Typically that is, so in order to receive the funding, um, that's typically things like you have to meet with the case manager, you have to do the, the financial literacy, you have, you know, you have to, there are some requirements for the, for the program in order to, to receive the funding. Uh, and so typically folks that don't want to do that, don't want to meet with the, you know, something will happen is somebody will get the first month's rent or support and then just disappear. Yeah. That, that has happened. And so they, they get um, um, exited for non-compliance. And then also, thank you for that, Alberto. Also, uh, like on slide seven of 20, 2019 service access at program exit, 45% it says did not access our center services at program exit. Is that considered to be a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Um, so it, in my mind, that's a really good thing. I mean, you, you would want more because um, that, what that's telling you is that those folks are no, lo are no longer needing those services. They've gotten to a point financially where they're, 
where they, they don't need to access our center services. Uh, that's a good thing. I wish there was more. Yeah, yeah, okay. So accessing it, is the, it means that they're getting support from the R center. They may not be helping them with rent, but they're helping them cover other expenses like the food or the, uh, yeah. the clothing or whatever other services the R center provides. Um, so yeah, they're still needing support, but 45% not using is a good thing. I wish it was, it was more. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, thank you very much, Alberto. We'll move on to our final agenda item uh, outside of other business, which is the 2021 agency funding. And I think that's you as well, Alberto. Yeah, and I'm, I'm pulling it up right now and I'll share it in a second. And just as a note for anybody who's looking through the packet, I think it says agenda item four on our, the agenda it's item five, but underneath agenda item four in the actual narrative is review 2021 human services funding in case you're looking for it. So tonight the goal is to do a couple of things. One is to finalize the hearing schedule and I apologize that we that I hadn't sent this out before so you'd have a chance to look at it. Um, but we wanna try and, and finalize our hearing schedule. And then uh, the other uh, piece is to hopefully finalize our priority allocation. Um, and I'll t before I get there, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that's important and how it's used. Uh, but first, I, I, I want to um, start by looking at really important what our hearing schedule is. Um, let's see. So in 2020, um, last for the 2020 round, we had five hearings in a five-week period, and they were broken up between morning, evenings, and one Saturday meeting. So we had two Thursday mornings two Thursday evenings and one Saturday morning meeting. Um, I think we saw 48 <laughs> applicants, I think, because it, it was a whole lot of, of, of agencies that you all interacted with at that time. Um, I can give you a quick update, even though it's, it's still not, it was, the application is not due until the 16th, but I did give an update to Karen today. So far, we only have 22 applicants um, that have applied, but I'm sure that some are procrastinating and I will get a flood uh, next week when it's due. I'm sure I'll get a bunch on Friday. Um, so, but 22 is not too bad so far. I mean, it, it, if we had 22 to, to hear, that would be easy, um, but I'm sure that it'll be more than that. So Karen and I worked on some potential dates for you all to consider tonight. Um, and we, we, th we think that in order to be sufficient to have enough dates for hearings, we think we need six. We don't say we're not actually gonna use all six, we may not, but we wanted to choose six so that um, we would ensure that we have enough hearings and it um, for the upcoming round of hearings. So here are some dates that we talked to, and I think um, I'm gonna look at my calendar because I so I can see. I think November 9th uh, is a Monday, and the 16th is a Monday. Um, the 18th. Wednesday. Wednesday. Second is a Wednesday and third is a Thursday. So we wanted to try and get stuff before it gets really, really crazy in the holiday time. Um, and then we had a couple of Saturdays that we could choose from. Of course, uh, November 14th is a Veterans Day weekend, so I'm not sure, but we, we, we put it out there. And Alberto, what, what time frames are you thinking for these morning, evening, afternoon? Well, we have more folks working, and so we're not sure if mornings would work this time. Um, I mean, and we're always open to it, of course, but. 
And just to set an expectation, we were definitely going to be missing one or two board members almost every meeting. Right? We, we always did, yeah. Yeah. But this gives you a few weeks to actually with the applications to review them. So. Um, so I guess, I guess what I say is that we're you know, really a, a starting place. So we're pretty open to whatever is going to work best for the majority of the advisory board members. Um, so, so if, you know, if you want to try to do some during the day, we can do that. Some during the evening. If you don't want to do Saturdays, uh, we just we just threw some things out um, as a as a place to as a place to start. And we also assumed that since the applications are due on the 16th of October, that um, that we we probably need to give you. Uh, and give us, you know, at least a good three weeks to get through uh, um, a, a good portion of the applications to review. So it's it's just it's a it's a it's a starting place. So we're really yeah. it'd be great to hear from the advisory board on what you want to do and what dates work and not work. Okay, so let's. Add, um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to try to change my view here so I can see you all. There we go. Um, let's get I some stop feedback sharing for now. If you all, if you want the other view, Brian. No, uh, it's it's good. I I I can if when I remember how I can actually do both at the same time. So I'm good. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's give Alberto and Karen some feedback on this proposed schedule. Thoughts? I like some of the mornings, but I'm actually totally flexible because I know there have been some people that can't do that or people that have kids at home. So whatever other people want, I'll just go along with. Because I don't have kids at home. Caitlin? I've got kids at home um, and I would, I think for me, the biggest thing would be to know sooner rather than later because then I can plan around like my husband's schedule and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it, the days of the week and so forth, all the days run together at this point. So there's no distinction between the week and the weekends in, in our house, but knowing sooner does mean that we can like line up if we need additional support or anything like that. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. Graham, Deanna. I like evenings and weekends for the most part. I can make some days work, but as a rule, weekends and evenings are best for me. Okay. Thank you. Deanna? I'm pretty flexible. That's why I really wasn't chiming in. I mean, I, it, like Caitlin, as long as I know far enough in advance, I can book it out on my schedule. So yeah. now that we're back in school, knock on wood, we stay in school, it's a lot easier for me as well. So if we stay that way, then I'm super flexible on these days. OK, great. Uh, Madeline, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty flexible. Let me just ask, uh, and you may have said it, and I didn't hear it, but um, are any of these going, uh, will we have virtual options, the option for virtual? I would assume they're all going to be virtual, Madeline. Okay. Then, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Um, Wednesdays, except for Wednesdays, Wednesday nights, uh, that we're still, that's the Boulder Police uh oversight mm -hmm. um we're still meeting every week so on wednesdays but other than that and even with that i'm i'm flexible because i can i can juggle there so i'm good i'm good i'll figure it out all right thank you Matt. Brian, what about out. you well i yeah um there's a few hard meetings i just took a look at my calendar depending on what time of whether it's morning afternoon or evening um, otherwise, I am pretty flexible, like everybody else, I could typically schedule. So maybe, so for me, the days look as good a spread as anything, right? It's logical, it's got a mix of things. Uh, I think it's the time of the meeting that becomes more important. And I wonder if, if we could do a doodle poll 
agreeing on those days, but simply get some responses about what time of day are people available, morning, afternoon, or evening, right? Or morning and evening or whatever. Um, then maybe we can choose those time frames so everybody can plan. We know which ones we're not going to be able to make in advance. We know which ones we can make and prepare accordingly. Would, would that be all right with you, Alberto, to put that together? I think so. So I yeah, just, Nicole I and I can do think, that. I just think the people that have kids at home, um, I hope they say what's best for them because I think they take priority. Sure, yeah, I agree. And so like for me, having uh, a kid at home, morning, evening, afternoon, it doesn't matter. He's going to open the door and start talking to me regardless, right? So he's going to interrupt my meeting no matter what time it is. Um, but I don't, he's not, he's old enough that we don't worry about nap time and things like that. So uh, we do want to prioritize that. Karen, I interrupted you, I think. No, 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 you didn't. Um, I was, I was interrupting you. So, um, so is it fair to say that, that generally speaking, that we should shoot for evenings? To the extent possible, I would love to get some morning or afternoon time simply because um, the evenings I'm lower energy. I'm typically, my mind isn't as, you know, I, I'm trying to flush things rather than take things in. <laughs> So, uh, you know, to the extent that we can get some of those day times, I like that. But and, and what about Saturdays? I mean, some people love them, some people don't. So, you know, are are either those Saturday options like you want to consider one Saturday option or? I'd rather not. I guess I agree with Brian. It's like when you're looking at the computer all day to do the evenings is tough because you're just fatigued from it, from all day. Even though people, the kids, they get the priority, but oof, if we could have a couple of mornings or days, that would be nice. What, what about Saturdays for you, Anne? It's all right, just the evenings are hard, but whatever. Okay. I'd I, I prefer to steer clear Saturdays, mainly because that's the only day, um, the weekend is the only day, because th these meetings, <laughs> Ah, I yeah. started Zoom this morning at 7.30 with the Longmont Community Foundation. So, um, yeah, okay. I would prefer to leave my Saturdays open if at all possible. So, so it sounds like we do need to doodle it and um, do our best to come yeah. up with a schedule mm -hmm. that will work for most folks most of the time. Yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, I'll add, um, I guess to Deanna's point too, like I've got one kid who's back in school. I've got one that's being homeschooled completely. So during the day, during the week, when he's actually at school, um, he's the younger one and is the one who would interrupt. Um, so during the day, during the week is kind of better in that sense. Um, Cause then it's really only dealing with a 10 year old who then, who can actually entertain himself and you know, not getting in our hair, so. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, so let's, uh, I, I think, so I'm open on Saturdays, but let's say this, the days that you chose, the dates are good. If we can just doodle to get some, you know, see the majority of times that people will be able to meet, we'll just lock those in. And I think to Anne's point, Please be honest, uh, we do, I, when you have kids at home, I mean, it, it is one of the hardest things. So uh, we will try to work around that as much as possible. We know that most people are not gonna be able to make every single meeting. That'll be taken into consideration. And Eliberto, I'm thinking the doodle poll, I've seen some polls with this and some without where you, say yes or no but sometimes you also have the option of it's a yellow indicator that's like if absolutely necessary i can do this but i prefer not to yeah um, i can i can work with nicole on, on on creating that um i'm just wondering if 
Aliberto, you can reach out to Shakita before you start the whole thing or whoever's going to start it. I have no idea what her schedule is. Well, She's not here well tonight. No, no, what I'm thinking of doing, so let me, let me give you my game plan now, now that we've had this conversation as directly from the board. What I'm thinking of doing is basically sending out a doodle poll. I'm going to, you know, to, to, to Madeline's point, I'm going to clear, stay clear of Saturdays unless we really have to. Um, and then I'm going to put all those dates in and I'm going to put a morning choice, an afternoon choice, and an evening choice. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see what people, and it'll be, so most of these are going to be about two to three hours. Uh, they've been three hours in the past, um, which is why sometimes the evenings are hard when you, it's a three hour. Yeah, it, it's, it's three hours. It's not two, Alberto. Right. Three or right. four. Yeah. Well, if we get twenty-two, if we get twenty-two applications, <laughs> we just have twenty-two applications. I'm sorry. <laughs> it would be. A no, I know, I know. So three hours. There'll be three hours. There'll be three hour blocks. Um, I'll do a morning and afternoon and an evening, and then we'll go from that. That's the game plan. Then we'll go from there. Great. That sounds good. Thank you. Now, Karen, my question to you: Since we're not making any decisions, do we need quorum for those? You know, no, we don't. We don't necessarily need a quorum, but I. Um, but I think really what we want to try to do is get as many people there as possible. It, right. it um, the, you know, the agencies go to a lot of work. They know it's a nine-member board, and then when they walk in the door and there's three board members, it's kind of deflating. So I think. Um, so I think I think it's important that we get a majority of the board members at each meeting and certainly the preference would be is that everyone is there for all all of them but I, I would say we certainly want a majority we don't have to stop the show though if that's your question right okay all right so, so that's the game plan i will work with uh with nicole um next wednesday to start getting those things out great thank you all right awesome all right so before we go so the next piece here is um priority uh, allocation. I'm going to just give you a little bit of background. Um, what we're about to do is we're about to set basically the uh, percentages that we want to apply to each of our buckets, right? We've talked about these buckets in the past, um, housing stability, uh, you know, health and well-being, self-sufficiency, self, self and resiliency, food and nutrition, education, skill building, safety and justice. So we, the board decided to uh, maintain those buckets for 2021, but we need to prioritize based on what we learned from our human services needs assessment. Um, and um, Karen and I took a really you know, a, a, new, a new look and a hard look at the human services needs assessment. And we both felt that the best guidance, because this human service needs assessment wasn't necessarily crafted to give you an easy answer on how you should prioritize. It was really more around giving you a broad uh, and sometimes specific picture on needs in the community. Um, and I think it did a good job of doing that, but it wasn't necessarily set to say this is how easily how you will prioritize. But we need these priorities primarily because the, I think the biggest thing or the biggest help they provide is they help us, they help the board uh, as they're doing deliberations really look at, at ceilings, uh, award ceilings per category, per bucket. Uh, and so that's where they're really important. The caveat I want to say, at least in the two years that I've been involved, um, and, and um, is that we rarely ever stick super close to what the allocations are. Sometimes we go a little over, sometimes we go way below. Um, but again, the importance is more around setting individual limits. Um, per priority and less about what we end up funding because as we, and I've said this before, we can't control, or we could, but we don't, 
um, we can't control who applies and what, well, we can't control who applies, but control what people apply for, how much they apply for. Um, so I just wanted to set that context as we go into the conversation. So this is what we, this is the, uh, Karen presented this to um, city council a few weeks ago. Um, this is our human services funding set aside, right? And here's how it's broken down. Um, you, you, you can see that the agency grant program is 877,455, which is an increase of about 107,948 from 2020. So we are increasing the amount. Um, so um, that is what we have for uh, human services agency grant funding. This, are the, this is the, the breakdown of the 2020 buckets, the 2020 uh, allocation limits. We had housing stability at 25%, health and well-being at 17.5, uh, equally food and nutrition, uh, and then education skill building, self-sufficiency and resilience, and then safety and justice was at the end, uh, was our lowest, and it was still 11%, so it wasn't a huge uh, amount, um, as I, I guess between, safety and justice and housing stability. So as I looked, as we looked at the uh, at how we're gonna prioritize for this year, again, a reminder that this human services needs assessment didn't lend itself to very readily do this. We both felt that the executive summary was the most appropriate place to find it. And you all have that, um, I didn't send out this packet, but you, you, ha you should have a copy of that uh, as a board already. Um, and really what we saw, the executive summary in recommendation one uh, looks at to prioritize, continue to prioritize housing stability um, and self-sufficiency and education. And then in recommendation three, they really bring in mental health care. Um, and recommendation two was much more around how services are delivered and less about which services are delivered. So it was hard to really draw anything from recommendation two. Recommendation two was really around how do we uh, how do we emphasize the no doors or, or no yeah no door is a wrong door uh, process for resource navigation which is of course I think very important but not necessarily something that we fund directly right that that happened outside of the purview of this board. Um, so really we looked at recommendations one and three that gave us things to fund. So here is where we let, where I landed. And again, these are arbitrary and the board can change them. I just, that, this is my thoughts. These are what I, when I, when I read that, read those things, I said, okay, this is the way that I would break it down. Um, I keep housing stability at 25. I moved up self-sufficiency uh, because that has become a bigger issue now with job losses and all sorts of, of challenges. Um, education, and in particular, when we talk about education, I'm talking about childcare, childcare slots, moved that up as well. I moved health a little bit down only because I know that with COVID, the health is still an issue. Um, and there's a lot of, of federal, you know, federal dollars going to health. Um, doesn't mean that there's still not a need. Same thing with food. To me, health and food were things that are still really important. And there's a lot of money coming from a lot of places for food uh, and health. And so that's why I felt that while they're still important, that we could use our funding a little more um, uh, effectively in these other top three buckets. And then safety, I kept it. I mean, I, we were at 11% last year. Uh, we were at ten percent this year. Uh, it, it, it's a need. It's it's always comes out, in, but it, it it affects or impacts a smaller amount of the population. So I'm going to stop there for any questions, and then I'll show you what it means monetarily. Unless you all want to see that first. Let's take uh, some questions now, Alberto, because I think 
just the prioritization relative to one another is a really helpful start for looking at how we would allocate funding. Okay. So any questions or comments for Eliberto feedback on the way this has been organized? Uh, so while you're thinking of your really vital question that you know you want to ask, I will throw in that uh, to, I think kind of second what Eliberto was saying, the, the fact that we apply percentages and we have this formula would almost make it seem like there's a lot of science and little art to having this discussion. But I think more than anything, the, the way that we approach it also, and perhaps most importantly, helps us make sure that we're confident that the decisions we're making are what we believe is in the best interest of the citizens of Longmont. So it really becomes a framework for how we think about these decisions. It's not a hard and fast rule. And as Alberto said, you know, we don't know who's, if enough people are gonna apply in, in self-sufficiency to actually even ask for 20%. But if somebody stops us on the street and says, why did you fund them? This framework helps us remember that we did that because the priorities were this and that priority indicated. Um, so that hopefully what I'm trying to say is we don't need to get too lost in the weeds, I think, but we need to be confident that we understand why we're making the choices we're making and particularly, and they are relative to one another. Um, so that's, I kind of extended into bloviating. So I'll stop there for a moment, but um, any questions or feedback? Does this look good to everybody? Should we interpret the silence to mean, okay, we got some thumbs up. All right, so I, I agree. I think it looks good. Um, my only question, and it's really a question of clarification, education, if I remember the needs assessment, I think the education component was oriented towards job skills training or developing skill sets for employment. Is that right? Right, but typically for us, that falls under self-sufficiency. Okay. So, and the reason I'm asking is because um, I, we're going to see impacts of COVID and people losing their jobs for years. Um, so trying to recover lost income, trying to recover lost opportunity. Is there a sense, do you recall from the needs assessment of whether a fair number of people will not be able to recover as quickly because they're not going to be trained for opportunities that will become available next year or the year after? Or is it really, we just lost a chunk of time that we are working and therefore we don't have that income? Uh, so I'm wondering if COVID has changed the way we think about job education as being the importance that it is. So I can I can speak a little bit to some of the populations. So the way that so the way that human services needs assessment primarily worked around population was based on HUD because this, uh, remember this is this is this is an addendum to the human services uh, a need assessment that was part of the consolidated plan. However, mm -hmm. and that primarily focuses on housing. So a lot of their survey questions were around homeowners, renters, uh, you know, that kind of, but there are some points where they talk about people who are hurt the most or will, will be uh, challenged the most. And they talk about what we talked earlier, single parents, people without high degrees, and Karen, I don't remember the other one. We, you and I talked about it, but uh, what was the other one? So you cut out, uh, did you say disabilities? People with disabilities? disabilities yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah, so we did find that those were the publishers that, that, that talked about being impacted the most by, by COVID. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. So I think that'll be important for us to keep in mind as well when we look at that general category and we start 
going through applications is the understanding of those specific needs within that category. And, and Brian, what I would also add is that if, if you recall that most of the data gathering occurred pre-COVID, so the yeah. days, uh, all that data, and, and so, you know, what we have that talks about um, job loss and job acquisition came out in the focus groups. And so I think there's some, you know, so that's, that's basically what we, you know, what we have. But I think certainly there are, are, are folks we heard from in the, in the focus groups that um, they have, it's a new normal for them. You know, yeah. their opportunity and, and doing what they did before is, is probably not, um, probably not coming back. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, you know, my, one of my thoughts is like housing stability, it's, it seems to be the bedrock of all the others is, you know, it's like every year here, I seem to better understand that if people are in their homes, they're feeling safe, there's more secure, there's more stable, and they can pursue some of these others. So um, I like that self-sufficiency is actually the second priority because I think in many ways, of course, they're linked. So I'm gonna show you now what it means. And again, it's really about helping us set a price ceiling. Um, in the past, we hardly ever stick to these numbers. Um, we come close sometimes, but typically we, we do vary. It really are guideposts. Yeah, exactly. To, to, or to Brian's point, it's a framework. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't tie us in completely. It just provides, it just gives us a framework. So this is what it would look like with, um, as we, as the numbers are, um, those are the, those are the, the, the limit amounts. And you can see that, um, you know, it, 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 it does definitely favor housing stability at 25%. Um, mm. But there's still quite a bit of funding for all the other all the other um, priorities. Categories. And I wanted to also show a comparison of 2020. So this is what this is what the numbers were in 2020. Are these the actual numbers for 2020 or what the kind of like bucket amounts were? The bucket amounts. Okay. Um, I can actually quickly look up what we spent. I can tell you that we that education we spent a lot more than that on education. Education, in particular, child slots, is one of our biggest requests. We have a lot of providers that come asking for um, for um, education dollars. We did not spend. I can also tell you that we didn't spend all the safety and justice dollars last year. Um, I don't think we spent all the housing stability dollars. I think we did spend all the self-sufficient. We spent a little more than that self-sufficiency. But really, those those are education and health were are were ahead of self-sufficiency last year. Do we publish these priority limits to the applicants um, during their process? We have not in the past. I think one of the challenges with having a, a structured approach, a numbers-based structured approach is uh, avoiding, you know, we, people will naturally have an inclination to try to use the approach to their advantage if possible. And uh, so as much as we can minimize that and that's part of our job in the interviews as well as to make sure that requests are substantiated. Um, I'm excited, frankly. I mean, I, I, I'm really grateful for council having agreed to increase the amount of funding over time. It's exciting to me to see these increased numbers in these areas. It's certainly the right direction and um, it just feels good. It feels like um, you know, there's some recognition of the importance of these services, so I'm grateful for that.
So I guess, do we need a, I think, I think that's my last slide. Do we need a motion to turn to approve the, these priority amounts? Yeah, let's, let's uh, entertain a motion. I think it'd be good, then we'd have clear direction that that's gonna be our framework. Yeah. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the funding amounts presented by Eliberto uh, as the the max the guidelines of maximum funding in each category? So moved. Madeline moves. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, this was your chance. I was looking straight at you. <laughs> Caitlin seconds. Okay. All right. Any other discussion, concerns, questions, clarifications? Okay. Let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor, uh, Madeline, you're going to have to give a verbal unless you can go on camera. Everybody on camera, raise your hand, please. Madeline, are you, you okay? I got it. Thank you. So we've got Madeline, Ann, Deanna, Caitlin, Karen Phillips, Graham, and myself. So the vote is unanimous to approve those limits. So thank you all. Um, next steps, just to, to so newer board members, I'm going to take what you just voted on. And I'm going to use that in creating a matrix. And Karen and I need to work on the weighting piece. That's something that staff does. But that'll be part of a matrix that you will that you will all see once you fill out your applications. I need to upload your evaluations. I, all of you should have a EC Impact account. I know I already did that. If you don't and access it, please reach out to me. Um, Karen and I will. I will work on the matrix. Karen and I will work on the on the um, on the uh, waiting piece because that's also very important. Um, and I'll use those priority limits that you just said to set the individual award ceilings. That's how they're used, as I mentioned earlier. Um, per so that's the. Those are the next steps. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Alberto applications are gonna they're due on the 16th when will when will they be available for us to review are they available now as they come in or no because it's not closed it has to it has to close okay i will try and get them that monday i'll try and work over the weekend to make sure you guys have them by the monday okay monday of the 19th great that'll be my goal um, it shouldn't be that difficult. This, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at, at, at the EC impact process now. Um, so I, I should probably have it by Monday. Um, so just for our new members, because we won't meet again until after those have gone out. If Graham and Ann, do you have any uh, kind of thoughts on efficiencies you have found in reviewing those or methodologies you use? Uh, because it can become overwhelming very quickly and difficult to know how to, at least in my experience, difficult to know how to uh, kind of measure one against the other. Do you have any thoughts on that that you'd like to share in Madeline as well? Um, my two cents I would offer is um, to try to read the applications of the people you're about to see present. And that was really helpful for me to do. So read them like within some time, like right before presentation or so they're fresh and mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Um, so Graham, you would, would you score them while they were presenting or did you score them afterwards or before? After I feel like the hearings went too fast to really do a good job of scoring. And so I would, you know, I think familiarizing yourself with what we're scoring them on before we start hearings is really important. And then I would take shorthand notes and then even create an outline for my notes about what we scored the folks on like diversity or uh you know are they taking input from their people and improving their systems etc and 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 then that would help me sort of tailor my questions and then i could take uh, 
uh, shorthand pen and paper notes and then go back later and uh, hopefully without too much time and score the uh, the organizations which I had recently just seen um, present because I think if it was too much time it was hard to remember and mm -hmm. um, and so I, I honestly I would even put in notes about the people who presented so it would help me trigger um, you know what color hair they will they brought a briefcase or or something to help my memory yeah. because three four hours and they're just rolling in and out and in and out and you know just any sort of trick to help help uh put an association between the people and the the screen and computer software you're scoring them on great thank you that's really helpful madeline do you have any suggestions um well in addition to um graham's excellent comments i would um one of the things that um, people commented to me about was uh, they felt we were engaged and very, very much so um, into what they were presenting because we were taking notes during the time that they were presenting. And uh, mm -hmm. while it is kind of hard to, you know, to keep up and try to catch you, can, you can basically get the main point. So, yeah. Great. So and the take, being able to take the notes uh, during their presentations, I think, gives them a, a sense that uh, we're paying attention and that what they're saying is important. Great. Thank you, Madeline. Thank and you. Anne, wisdom? No more than that. I mean, it was good eye contact, but I don't know if we can do that now or if it does still work, so. Yeah. Alberto? And I, I just want to remind the board that I think with your feedback, and I appreciate your feedback, I've re, um, redone the board evaluation and made it hopefully run a lot closer to the application. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the 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 of the of the, the things the board uh, provided feedback was on that the application and and the evaluation didn't run parallel and sometimes mm -hmm. didn't make sense or there's hard to make the connection. And hopefully, I've done a, a, a good enough job that as you're doing this, the e evaluation itself will help you maybe even prepare for the hearing. So, yeah. great, thank you. I'm looking forward to that. I, I'm excited with those changes. Um, and for myself, I'm a perpetual procrastinator. Um, I'm certain that it's one of those social behaviors where my mind is much sharper under pressure and that's the reason I do it. But um, I almost always wait what I feel is too long. Uh, what I have found really helpful though is to come in to the interviews with one or two questions that are very specific and of specific interest to me because it engages, makes me feel more engaged during the presentation because I'm listening to certain things. And uh, as Graham mentioned, this this is the do as I say, not as I do. Uh, if you can if you can finish as quickly as possible after the evaluation, just as a note, I find it really challenging every year because there is no absolute scale, right? It's a relative process between five groups who are proposing to serve this area. It's like, well, this one, is, you know, I, I would say is not quite as good as this one. And uh, so one of the challenges I have is getting to the end of evaluating something and thinking, gosh, you know, if I knew what I knew now, I'd probably evaluate that first one differently. Uh, but if you have good notes, like Graham indicated and Madeline indicated, then um, you can always go back. So just engagement. All right, thank you for the feedback. And I just learned a lot myself. Uh, yes, Karen Phillips. I, uh, do we get this stuff through the email or how do we get this information to look over or on? So, so Karen, you should have already gotten from me. Um, and yeah, I did. You but should go. So right now there's nothing for you to see because uh, I have not populated your account. So I think, Alberto, the question is, if I'm understanding, are are these these are right online application reviews? So no, no, that, that's, not, 
No, I, I just the answer was right. I mean, he'll let me know. he'll let me know what's going on by an email is what I meant to say. Oh, okay. okay. No. Yeah. 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 yeah, and it it is a pull process. It's not a push process. So nobody pushes the applications to us. We have to log in and pull them down. Correct. But Got I'll it. email you once they're all up, loaded, and everything ready to go. Got it. Thank you. Great. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, Alberto, for all the work on that. I think everything looks really good. It'll be a good year for evaluations, I can feel it. And uh, I think it'll be an exciting year for our partners to deliver services, because they're definitely needed. Okay, is there any other business? Graham? Uh, do we have any part to play or support to provide uh, counsel with this um, parking lot for helping you know, folks living in their vehicles and RVs? Good question. Council Member Christensen. This is a, a possibility. It's a discussion of a possibility. Um, there are a lot of pluses and minuses and it's dependent completely upon the county. We have no control over that. It, it, the, the RV, uh, I mean, the what was asked is to have a discussion with the county about whether they would allow us to have, to reserve a few spaces down at the um, campground, which is closed in the winter time um, because when they, they never envisioned anything uh, but a summer campground. So when they put the piping in, they put the piping in about a foot below the ground. So they have to turn the wall, you know, it's, uh, um, so they have to <laughs> drain it and turn it off in the winter, like, you know, your, any sprinkler system. <laughs> um, and um, so people will have to be self-sufficient if they go down there. But in any case, the, I think, and Karen could verify this, I think that the county is open at least to people with RVs being able to dump their um, gray water and black water down there, which means sewage. Um, and that would be very helpful because that's one of the biggest problems. But the, the other big problem is that the, all the RV parks in the county are, have waiting lists. There isn't a place for people to go, but we can't let them live on the streets either because they're, they're creating a huge amount of not everybody, but they're creating a huge amount of um, trash, uh, mm -hmm. human waste, uh, needles, uh, general trash, <laughs> and um, and um, insecurity in the mem in in residential areas, you know, yeah. and also some commercial areas where bad things are going on, and the people who leave those commercial areas. Uh, have to go past or through um, RV, uh, bunches of RVs that are, um, can be scary, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are places where people are doing drugs, selling drugs. And so we have about 61 RVs that are kind of a chronic problem roaming around this city. And it was okay when there were two or three, it's not okay now. We have to do something but what you know winter's coming up we can't but we can't let them keep living on the street especially with COVID because when they throw out trash and stuff yeah so it's a very difficult problem and um but it the whether Boulder County will let us uh issue a certain number of permits to for people to park down there is um, unknown. It's up to the county. But the other thing is that that is also, if there was a big fire or, uh, or a flood, God forbid, um, that campground would have to be used for people and for 
animals uh, being evacuated. And so it's, it's, it was never intended to be an all year campground. So it, it's a very complicated situation. Do you have any other questions about it though? I don't, I was just curious if this board could uh, offer assistance or help with any of that. Right, that's what I was just gonna ask. Is that kind of, was that your question? Is like, is there a, either a desire or an opportunity you know, for the advisory board to weigh in. And, and, and I would say that, um, you know, to add on to what Polly said is that I think that the primary um, advisory body is going to be the, um, the homeless solutions for Boulder County. So it is, uh, there is a, an executive board um, and, a, and a policy team that they're gonna, they're basically are going to be the, the, the folks that are, um, reviewing this and making a recommendation to the commissioners and um, and those recommendations will inform the, the commissioners. Um, and, but if there is something, but those meetings where they will deliberate the executive board, those are public meetings. So, you know, again, so if you are interested in getting information about this, you know, want to weigh in, um, you know, to the executive board of HSBC. So those things are all possible kind of depending on what your, you know, what your desire is. I think the, I think what the commissioners would really be interested in, in, in terms of the fairground is, um, is just, we would want folks that are, that would need temporary place to stay to be engaged in the homeless solutions for Boulder County effort so that they can get on the path to housing. Yeah, it, it's, it seems uh, it's it's so complicated and you know when you raise security issues and the idea of like is a distributed solution better than a concentrated solution for those reasons um and it really gets challenging uh, I, I you know like i wonder occasionally about the sugar mill and would that be a temporary location for, because of course they're already parking everything that's made out there for storage so could you know, that serve as some kind of grounds, but that's privately owned. So, you know, I think it, it just helps Eliberto and I continue to work harder to find um, solutions in terms of housing that is, housing. More, yeah. that is more stable, that is more secure. Uh, yeah. So we're working with the uh, Boulder County to submit uh, a grant to the, to the state for some um, some possible additional dollars, and so we'll we'll put our hat in the ring about that. We are looking at a, a variety of other options, but um, so it it just compels us to continue to find housing exits for for folks who are living in um, very unstable situations and are yeah. and looking for you know more permanent housing. Well, thank you for all the work that you and your staff do, Eliberto and Karen, on that because it's it's the issue. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Madeline. Yes, I just have a couple of things. Um, one, the Longmont Community Foundation is sponsoring a seminar. Uh, specifically on how to recruit, um, how to diversify your boards, how to recruit to diversify your board, board of directors for uh, organizations. I can send Karen, if you don't know about it, uh, I can send Karen the details um, of, the, uh, of the event. Uh, that's one thing. And then the last thing, <laughs> is some time ago huh. was karen talking oh i thought karen was speaking <coughs> I, I, I don't I hear, didn't sound hear you so madeline i just would say go ahead and and do send me another copy of that notice i i did get one um, but it would be helpful to have another one and, and that we can send it out to the advisory board. Okay, I will do it. And uh, the other thing is some time ago, we voted uh, to, as a board, to 
do photographs and brief bios. Um, and different things got in the way that uh, preempted that. And I am very much interested in following through on that and completing that. Um, and so I, I was wondering, is that something we are still going to do? Um, yeah. Well, that is a great question. So the I think we should still do it. Um, how we would do such a thing, I'm not sure. Although I did, Madeline, just to get this moving, yes. I did take a get a screenshot here of all of us <laughs> and figure that that can be at least the placeholder for us. Although oh, we are Madeline, missing. you have a good memory. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, and the first person, the first person that became ill, and I ran into him not too long ago, I'm trying to remember his name. Dave, was it? Mm. Do you guys, anyway, he, he, left, he left us because of health reasons. All and right. that was one thing that deferred it. And then there, then of course, there've been a number of things, but, the thing that makes me know that we can do it is um, Adriana Correa with uh, LMAC and with Community Neighbor. Uh, I think you guys know her. At any rate, she just uh, she continues to update the LMAC website, and I know she just um, tweaked it with some information that I sent her. So it, it, it's doable. Okay. just individually why, why don't we do this madeline uh because this is a task that has languished for years uh, so <laughs> can you get me the contact of the individual that you just spoke about who's doing it i will reach out unless karen already knows so so what i would just say uh brian and, and to madeline you know clearly that this is something that you we want to do the business here, and, and I have to tell you that since March, there is we hardly are getting anything done. So, um, so we will. So, we doesn't have to be Adriana. We can certainly um, we can work with Nicole and and see if that okay. um, so my efforts have really been um, it, it diverted away from thinking about that, Madeline. <laughs> I'm sorry. So. We we will put it back on the uh, the agenda. We will we will get it organized. I'll put it in the notes, and when Nicole gets back, uh, we will we will put together a plan to get that accomplished. Okay. So awesome. thank you. Thank Madeline. you very much. Okay. With that, seventeen minutes early. I will, yeah. It actually at, at like seven thirty, it looked like we were going to be done at seven forty-five, but here we are now at eight forty-five. So, um, is there a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Karen Phillips, motion to adjourn. Deanna seconds, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Have a great week. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Too. Thank you. you too. Bye-bye.